Okay, so I'll give you a brief explanation of the delay in uh, logging on or, you know, having you guys get the uh, <clears throat> log on link couldn't be helped. Uh, uh, earlier today, at, you know, in Berkeley, I went uh, to go shopping to a local grocery store and then when I got to the parking lot, I saw I had a flat tire. Can't drive like that, so I waited over an hour, of course, for AAA. And they said it's shredded. You'll have to have it taken somewhere. So it had to be towed. So then that added. So I'm lucky I made it here at all, <laughs> which I did just in time to catch my breath. And uh, that's what the delay was. So uh, my apologies, but you know, we have a phrase we used to use in the Midwest. My aunts and uncles would say, sometimes you feel like you've gone through hell and high water. You know, well, that's <laughs> no high water, it's just, you know, problems. But at least no harm was done other than the cost of replacing two tires, it turns out, too, because the other one apparently was not in good shape. These things happen, but it's better it happened before than when I was on the freeway. Otherwise, you wouldn't be seeing me at all for a while, perhaps ever. I've had a blowout on the freeway at high speed once on the Santa Fe Bridge, and the highway patrolman said, you handled your vehicle just right. You knew which way to turn the steering wheel. You might have been in the bay. <laughs> And that was in broad daylight. It was just some work construction spike, a metal spike that hit one of my tires. And then the other tire blew out from another one. So I had a double blowout. Yeah, that was the scariest moment I've had on freeway. So I can't count my blessings. And I apologize to you for the delay. But you can see it wasn't anything I could have done anything to prevent. Here we go. The good news is we are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, at this point, um, the, the, there are two things that, you know, this class is this lecture, this half of this week's lecture is on a very important topic, African art, of course, in which we are going to uh, see, as we did with the Pacific Island um, slides on Monday, just a handful of really very intensely meaningful slides that have to do with the local culture in each part of Africa, where those things came from. These are covered in your book. I hope you've read the chapter in Stockstead on African art after 1800. That's the topic uh, that we are looking at now. Um, <clears throat> but what we're going to do before we get to that uh, is briefly remind you that on Monday, the 31st Halloween, I will be coming back from a very important family business uh, meeting. It's not really business. I don't, I don't have any businesses myself. I don't mean that I'm at, you know, family uh, matters that can only be handled in person. And that's the only weekend that, the, that all of us involved can make it. So I will not be giving a live lecture like I usually do on Monday, but I will record it before I leave and post it on YouTube like I usually do by Friday evening. And that will be the, it's a very important lecture too. If you flip ahead to the 31st, right, of November, of, of, sorry, I mean, October, you'll see that uh, it's on realism and impressionism. And that's a big topic. So what I think I'll do is just cover the realism part. Not that that's not important, but impressionism is something more people know or have an interest in or experience with or have seen or however you want to word it. It's better known. And yet it's totally misunderstood. A lot of people understandably think anything fuzzy, any painting that looks fuzzy is impressionistic. No, that's not the definition. But you'll see some pretty familiar, famous works of art by uh, really well-respected artists who were rejected by the entire society they lived in, except other artists and a few critics when they first started this movement called Impressionism. That'll be an important topic because at least one of those slides will be on the exam. But I'll probably do the actual slides of the Impressionist paintings, or at least almost all of them, on that Wednesday when I'll be back and it'll be live because I, I'm guessing you'll have questions and that's why I like teaching non or, or a uh, don't like there we go don't like teaching asynchronous courses I think everybody knows this if you didn't now I'm telling you something that we just heard from the uh, art department chair about three weeks ago from now on all of the online classes starting in uh, next semester what spring semester 2023 are going to be asynchronous I know that works for a lot of people. I understand that, <clears throat> but it, I, I don't like that kind of teaching. What I do is talking to a blank computer screen and then I don't get any feedback and students can't ask questions in real or live time. So I, I opted to go back to all in-person classes and that's what I'll be doing three artistic classes in the spring semester. <clears throat> all right, let's get started with our first, let's see, is anybody? Oh yeah, let me let, 
you didn't miss anything, Adrian, except the fact that my reason, it's not an excuse, the legitimate reason for being lazy ahead of uh, uh, <laughs> in Berkeley. Okay, so I'm not going to unmute anybody now, but if you want to unmute yourself, it's free, of course. So let's get to our first must know slide for today. Uh, whoops, I think I already covered that. Let's see, there we go, screen share. <clears throat> Sorry, slightly frazzled from that hassle this morning. Okay, here we go. So let's get this full screen. And uh, we are going to now, see, I have more than the four slides we're covering. Because of the limited time we have, I, I don't like rushing through uh, any work of art or any important cultural source without giving you some context or background. And you've noticed that that's what I've been doing the whole time this semester is to try and give you guys some, you know, uh, historical and cultural context. So let's do that first. Uh, and then we will get to the four slides uh, that we're covering today, um, <clears throat> which I'll go ahead and just give you a heads up here. Where, oh, wait a minute. Why is there no, where is the, there it is. Okay. Okay, so I'm just reviewing in my mind which one I was. I'm not, I had to, I decided not to put a longer list and then cut one or something like I usually do. So, all right. Um, so we're uh, going to talk about African art. So let's say a little bit about the continent of Africa uh, that a lot of people don't realize. First of all, it is the second most populous continent on earth about one and a third billion people. Only Asia has more people. And uh, there are more countries in the continent of Africa. And that's partially a leftover legacy of colonialism. Of course, obviously European colonial incursions that uh, carved up different parts of the continent into their own little bailiwicks. And of course, took the resources they could get from those colonies. Eventually, uh, they won independence, usually within the first decade or two after World War II. So many of those countries only became nations, independent nations, in the last 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, they haven't been on the world stage as long as some other countries due to the colonial uh, occupations that occurred. But the thing about Africa that I think a lot of people don't realize is that there, let's see, is there someone else who, yeah, I think there is once, yes, let's let this. Welcome, Alpha. We're just starting. We, this is not, I'm not yet talking about the first must know slide. We'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Uh, what I am going to talk about, though, is a little bit of the context of this. Take two or three minutes. Uh, Africa before the colonial era, okay, before the arrival of Europeans, Africa had a number of uh, sophisticated or you could say highly developed urban cultures. We're talking about during the period in Europe that was called the Middle Ages. Not the Dark Ages, that is a bit of a misnomer because the latter Middle Ages weren't the Dark Ages, but they were still medieval. And you know, that involves superstition and belief in witches and, you know, the Inquisition <laughs> and all kinds of warfare and things like that. So I think it's important then to, to make sure that uh, people are aware that Africa had a very uh, highly developed urban civilization in certain areas of the continent. For instance, in an area where it's Nigeria today, the country of Nigeria is the largest population of any African country. It used to be a British colony. I've had friends from there. One of my daughter's teachers in grade school was, was from there, she and her husband. So I have some, some knowledge of it from people who grew up there. And it, it was, uh, for hundreds of years, there was a kingdom called the Songhai Kingdom or Songhai, S-O-N-G-H-A-I. So I usually see it spelled though it could be spelled differently in different books. It was an urban civilization with centralized government. And uh, they had, let me hide this here. Yeah, so that's not distracting from what we're gonna be talking about. And it was uh, well regulated. They rarely had uh, any issues with you know, hunger, certainly not mass starvation. Plagues of course affected the whole world at this point, pretty much the whole world. Um, and they had cities uh, that were fortified. Uh, and, you know, uh, sort of an early, for not like the Romans, but still a, a very usable road system to connect, you know, to a transportation system between those cities. Um, and that was back in the 12, 13, 14, even into the 1500s. And then pretty soon after that, it was when the first European colonists arrived, of course. Uh, so for hundreds of years, they were a very developed society. So I think it's important 
point to keep in mind. Um, and then we also have the influence of African art on um, <clears throat> the uh, modern movement known as abstract painting or sculpture, which would be, of course, as some of you may know, the uh, source for Picasso's artwork. And we are going to talk about Picasso, so it's not getting ahead of myself too much to say this. Now, what we're looking at is today is the source for many of the most so-called innovative, you know, and original early uh, 20th century painters and sculptors like Picasso and Matisse. And, and they did, to, to give them due, they gave credit openly, in fact, very vociferously every time they were interviewed to the source and the inspiration, which was a lot, both African and Pacific Island sculpture, especially like the kinds of things we're going to see today. Okay, um, this is one that I've decided that because I want to focus on where there's a lot of very detailed meaning, we're going to go on to uh, the first one on the list today, which is spirit spouse. Okay, here's your first must know now. So you definitely want to take notes on this. Um, okay, spirit, two words, spirit spouse, of course, is S-P-O-U-S-E, spirit spouse. And uh, the date of this, uh, well, sorry, the location first, of course, Ivory Coast, that's a country that used to be a French colony, by the way. So many of the people there speak French and they're native indigenous language. And so it's on the West Coast of Africa. Ivory Coast, two words, and then we don't have an exact year. So you could write circa 1900s or what is on the syllabus 20th century. And remember, you don't have to use the little C when you're writing dates where uh, that's on the syllabus, because that just is a shorthand way of saying about or around a certain uh, de a decade or, or century. And we don't know the exact year. So or, this was done probably sometime shortly after 1900. So this is the kind of art that Picasso would have gone and Matisse and other early uh, modern painters and sculptors, they both both Picasso and Matisse and most other painters who are famous from the early 1900s in Western art uh, were both painters and sculptors. And they were both as painters and sculptors directly influenced by these kinds of figures that they saw in museums in Paris or London or whatever city they, they uh, went to, to view world art. <clears throat> okay, so spirit spouse, that right there gives you a clue. But hopefully you've read this in your in your stock stat. And I've looked up some more things about it since I started teaching uh, 1.2 uh, in the last few semesters. It's fascinating. This is a kind of magic figure, which is much smaller than life size. I mean, the most they would be is about 18 inches. And this one is probably closer to, it's about a foot. You know, it could be eight to 12 inches, but usually they were around a foot, sometimes a foot and a half. They were carved wooden, you can say an effigy, but that implies it's a portrait of an actual living person, or at least some people would think that's what effigy means. That's not the case here. What is it for? It's to give a person on earth, a living member of a given tribe or village who had not yet found a mate or spouse. In other words, it couldn't find a life partner yet maybe well into their whatever 20s or something when they, most of the other people in their generation had already you know, married or started a family and they wanted to, but they had no, no luck, right? They had not been able to find a mate or a spouse or a significant other. Okay, um, so what would they do? They'd go to a, a tribal spiritualist, that'd be the best word to use. A shaman, the other way you could say that too. A shaman is, is a general term worldwide for a person who's a spiritual figure and has the power to supposedly conjure up certain magical or spiritual forces. So what would this shaman do to help that person? They would carve a wooden figure, that's what we're looking at, of someone assuming in this case, okay, you know, obviously we're not, you know, assuming anything because these days you don't want to do that, but let's say this was a male tribe member who couldn't find a wife. So that shaman would carve a female figure with features similar to other females that were in that culture. And then what's so interesting, dress up that figure. Look at the details here of the, of the belt and uh, the uh, necklace 
and the headdress. These are all very finely carved details. And then there's also the striations. Now, I've used that word in the Monday lecture, and if you weren't here or you didn't write it down, you should now, because I'm not saying this is one I will or won't cut. We'll see how it goes during the review for the midterm, the, the next, uh, or sorry, I'm at the final. <clears throat> That's right. The, the only other exam that you will have to know individual slides, like you did, you know, already on your midterms, will be the final. The uh, second midterm, I've, I've been saying this for for a couple of weeks now, is going to be a totally different format as required by the art department's new guidelines. It's an essay format. I'll explain it all. You'll have plenty of time to, to you know, prepare, and, and there won't be a, a facts and dates and things like that. It'll just be a slide analysis in depth, like a short paper would be. We'll get to that. That's not until November 9th, though. <clears throat> okay, so back to what this is. is a carved figure or figurine, you could say that, if you say effigy, it usually implies of, a, of an actual living person. So I'd say a figure or figurine, that means a miniature of a human being, who would be perhaps possibly able, according to shaman, grants this figure or figurine the power to help that tribe member who came to him or her, could be a female or male, a, a shaman, a holy man or woman, would grant that figure, the, the shaman would, the power to help the person who hadn't found a spouse to find one. So spirit spouse. So in other words, somewhere out there, they believe with the spirit of someone who would then make themselves, you know, present through the actual physical contact after this figure had been prayed to, right? And, and or uh, chanted over perhaps um, for whatever amount of time it took to find a spirit that would then move uh, actual living woman to decide to be the mate of that person, of course, to uh, become that significant other, that spouse, in other words. So it's a kind of an interesting intervention, you could say, a concept that I, I don't think of. Any of the other world cultures that I've ever taught or, or studied, have I heard of another uh, culture besides ones in Africa that had that very uniquely fascinating and I think um, very touching concept. And you know, often I'm sure that it worked, if nothing else, by giving the person who was having trouble finding someone a positive attitude so that when they met someone who possibly might be a future mate, that, that, that things worked out. Anyway, so that's what the idea behind this is, that it had magic powers. And it would be, as you, I think you could see, it looks like this would be someone who's already, it's the form of a figure, okay, an image, let's say, of someone that eventually this this person that, that came to this tribal, it could be a man or a woman, in this case probably wouldn't be a man because they were looking for a female partner to have a, a family with. And then uh, this is already a pregnant female spirit who is then going to somehow motivate someone in that village or wherever that man wants to find or look for a future mate, uh, motivate someone to become that person's spouse real as in live spouse and the spirits of the other world is what motivates them through this figure it's a fascinating concept okay so that's the meaning let's do a formal analysis um <clears throat> that you can see that this i already mentioned it it's multi-dimensional but it's mostly wood so the oh by the way it's polished yeah you not only pray to it every day you fed it you, you would leave pieces overnight. And of course, who knows if maybe somebody like a cat or a mouse would actually eat the food, but supposedly it would sometimes not be there in the morning. So you know, in the dead of night, perhaps the food would be taken by something, uh, supposedly the spirit's uh, it spouse itself, his or herself or itself. So you would see this you know, uh, figure being cared for like it was alive is the point. And that's still part of the meaning that you didn't just pray to it, you took care of it. You made sure that it was nicely, uh, smoothly um, rubbed or waxed, and that's what gives it this sheen. And so we're now going to segue into the formal analysis, this, this shiny sheen, because the owner would have done that. And then maybe if, you know, at some point, they lost, as happens, of course, especially that far back all over the world, the mortality rate was pretty high, you know, unfortunately, both in childbirth and, and, and early or mid midlife. So if that person lost that spouse that they found, they might have to re-invoke this same figure, the same spirit spouse for another chance. So you'd want to keep it and take care of it. 
uh, and that would require, again, quote, feeding, end quote, some kind of food or, or liquid um, that you would place before it. I don't know if it's every day, but every so often. And also uh, polishing it and waxing it. So let's do the formal elements. The texture is the real smooth texture of polished wood, as well as obviously varying. I love the details here. Look at that face. Look at the eyelids, the lips, the nose, and these striations of scar tissue along the side of the face here. Um, and that's all done, of course, with carved line. There's also a uh, similar texture on the headdress, because that at first I thought that was a separate piece of, uh, you know, attached piece. But I don't think so, at least in some of these I've read about, that most of them, they were actually carved to make it look, therefore, obviously, simulate realistic detail, simulate texture of a kind of woven headdress, cloth headdress. And then these are actual objects that are not simulated, uh, beads, right, as a necklace and uh, a uh, belt. <clears throat> okay, it, it is, Mm, I'd say mostly stable because it's a human figure standing upright with the head and neck pretty much straight. You know, although the eyes are closed, I was going to say looking at us, but not not literally. But there is obviously a lot of dynamic detail: the top of the head, the breast, the, the, the belly, probably pregnant, uh, and the legs. So it's both stable and dynamic. I kind of think you have to call it a single mass, but you could break it down and say then the figure is the largest mass, and then the base. Okay, the rhythm is pretty obvious that arms and hands and legs and feet and eyes and uh, the patterns on the cheeks and the striations. It's a lot of rhythm. Um, there's no modeling. There would just be the natural shadows from the sun, of course, in the village. Now it's in a museum. I'm not sure which museum. Um, so now it'd be the lighting from the museum that creates the modeling. The color is entirely warm, uh, except for a little bit of the beads on one part of this multi band. I guess it's four bands of beads. Uh, the bottom band of the uh, belt. That's really the only cool color. Everything else is warm brown or yellow or red. Uh, and then here there is clearly altered proportion. There's no scale issue. Remember, that's always between two figures, right? Uh, where there's a difference in one being too large for the other human figures around it. Uh, or animals. This is not that. Uh, there's no no issue of uh, any kind of uh, uh, altered um, scale, but yes, there is proportion wise, because the legs are a bit too short for the rest of the body. And the belly is a bit, the whole torso and the belly particularly are a bit uh, elongated compared to it. And the head is larger than it would normally be for the, the neck. So there are, and that's a part of African uh, concept of African sculpture that inspired the early abstract painters and uh, sculptors like Picasso and Matisse. Uh, they just hadn't seen that kind of concept where whatever the human figure uh, part, sorry, of a human figure was important. And of course, if you're looking for a spouse to start a family with, obviously, if it's a female, it would be the belly with perhaps obvious pregnant condition, and then also the face, of course, where the personality uh, would come through. So those are the two most emphasized or exaggerated details, and that makes this not realistic or altered proportions. Okay, a balanced, yes, it's a human figure standing upright. And for space, it's about a foot tall. Well, I'd just say between 12 and 18 inches. Uh, I think it's somewhere in the middle there. And there is overlapping only is the technique of the, obviously the headdress overlapping the top of the head and the necklace and belt overlapping the body. Okay, and as I said, the lines are all carved lines. Okay, let's move on to our second must know. And this is a decorated building royal compound. I could have wrote in a royal compound, but I'm trying to keep these titles short. Decorated, you know, with an ED, building royal compound. Could have put a, to be accurate, an extra comma after building, but uh, you get the point. It's a decorated building in a royal compound. And the location is the Republic of Congo, and the date is circa 1980. So this is relatively recent. It's an important detail, it's part of the meaning. There are two Congos. When I was growing up, all we heard about was the Belgian Congo and the rebellion against the brutal, oh, it was a brutal uh, colonial government that ruled 
over the indigenous people. And that led to a rebellion called the Mau Mau. Some of you may know about this. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, you don't have to write that. You could just say that since the liberation of the colonies, the European colonies and what's now called the Congo, they, they become two countries. And this is the Republic of Congo, which is the smaller of the two countries that were created out of the original Belgian colony. So that is part of the meeting. Well, I'll say that again. Originally, this whole area called the Congo was one large colony under almost entirely under Belgian rule, colonial rule, obviously. Uh, and then it's after they got independence, it became two countries, uh, of which the Republic of Congo, Congo is the smaller of the two. So it's right in central, not western or e not east or west Africa. It's right in the center of the continent of Africa. Okay, so this would be where a ruler and his or her, probably mostly they would be males at this point in this culture, but male or female, just say the ruler and his or her family would reside in uh, this particular uh house or structure and then also hold meetings with the uh, elders and or you know uh, upper as you could say upper level members of that society to make decisions for that village that that community you know uh, it would be a small town or village uh in uh you know not a big city right or on, it's not a suburb of a city it's you know an isolated village in uh the interior of Africa in the Republic of Congo, Congo, and this would have been a building that would have had a lot of attention to the construction and the decoration. That's what we're going to fo focus on on the meaning. You can already see in, in a view from you know this distance, but let's get up close. If you look closely, this is a really intricate set of patterns and decorative details. These uh, pieces of wood, and I believe it's bamboo, but I guess you can just say kind of a light wood, uh, bamboo-like or bamboo wood. Uh, these, these individual um, stalks or reeds, you could say if it's bamboo, that's what they'd be called, are overlapping and, and uh, interlocking. It's fascinating. The geometric patterns that you can you know, see as your eye goes from you know, one side from say left to right across this and then you have reeds that are the actual wall itself which also could be bamboo or they just say uh, reeds that are a bamboo like uh, kind of, of uh, plant and those keep out of course obviously <laughs> the wildlife in the jungle areas of africa but also uh, help the interior stay you know neither too hot nor too cold comparatively of course it still could get quite hot but um, they help moderate you could say that way the um, temperature inside for especially when this building was full of say dozens of people having a meeting that might last hours that's a big important detail and then my other reason why I find, find this fascinating is the uh, color it's uh, stained with some kind of dye, whether it, by now in 1980 it was probably commercially purchased in a city, but we don't know that. But it could have been earlier, would have been these kind of houses, in other words, were created for hundreds of years before the arrival of Europeans for the elders and the village leaders, including the actual ruler of each village uh, where they might live, but also hold these meetings. And so they would have originally used the vegetable dyes to create these fascinating kind of a light reddish pink tint of you know, darker and lighter alternating hues. A very, very complex process to create the decorative detailing on this house. And then the roof, it should be obvious, but if it isn't, you should write this. These houses are almost always made of thatch, which is of course dried grasses, thatch tied together, bundled together. That's an old style of roofing goes all the way back to Roman times in all over Europe in the Middle Ages, houses from almost all of them had that roof. Well, not all, in Northern Europe they did. It seems unusual to think of it as well in the, you know, um, Central African, Sub-Saharan African countries, they would use <coughs> grass, but it was a plentiful and obviously readily available material um, because clay tile would be the other common worldwide material used by cultures all over the globe for thousands of years and that would be in countries that have a mediterranean climate obviously the mediterranean countries on the coast of that sea in europe and in north africa but also in asia and parts of latin america but here in the center of africa the interior of africa they're using thatch or dry grass okay that's 
pretty much the whole meaning. Okay, let's do our formal analysis. This has balance, completely symmetrical left to right, but because of the pitch, it's called a, a peak or gable, high peak gable. That is common all over the world uh, for, you know, because in this case, I don't think you had to worry about snow, I doubt it, in Central Africa, uh, being shed off of a roof like in Europe or North America, but you, but you would have to worry about uh, rain and uh, you know, water being shed. So that's why they have a high peak roof. That's actually overlaps into the meaning. So that, of course, is narrower than the bottom part where the walls are. So once again, it is unbalanced to the bottom and symmetrical, completely balanced left to right. The rhythm I've already mentioned, but now if you didn't write it, of course, for the formal elements you want to put, is very strong. I would even use the word powerful rhythm. Some say even hypnotic when you look at these patterns going across the walls of these interlocking geometric shapes created by wood or bamboo-like wood. Uh, panels, right, interlaid and interlocking each other. Powerful rhythms, of course. Uh, and then for mass, I really, I think you pretty much have to say it's just a single mass. But for space, of course, uh, it's a building. It's not going to have any techniques for space. There's always a building is real space. So it's one large open rectangular room uh, with about a 12 foot high ceiling, 12 to 14 feet high the ceiling inside, peaked. I should say peaked or peak gable, high peaked or uh, gable uh, ceiling. Uh, and that reaches actually a little bit more than 12 feet. But no, let's say between 12 and 15 feet. So up to or nearly 15 feet high. That's the real space. Color, warm. I, I would say even though it looks off white at first glance, when you get up close, you see these bamboo poles here. That's assuming what they are. I have a light pink tint. So, And then the thatch roof, well, that's gold color. That's what happens when grasses turn, you know, dry and become, you know, bundled up to be used for a roof. There, the color is by definition more, but don't we see any cool colors here? Um, and then we have um, the uh, stable on the walls and dynamic on the roof, obviously. Um, and uh, let's see, textures are the real smooth texture. Uh, in this case, if it's bamboo, it would be smooth. You could say smooth bamboo or bamboo like wood. Uh, real texture is not simulated, but rough texture, rough real texture on the thatched roof. Okay, and uh, there's no technique for modeling here. I uh, would just natural shadows from the sun. The line here is visual line around the edges of each of these geometric shapes, right? So that's visual line. It's not carved, right? Uh, uh, nor is it painted. And of course, the corners of any building, whatever style it is or purpose, by definition, create visual line. In fact, this is definitely bamboo right there. You go, you can see that it's a bamboo pole. Okay, uh, and then finally, the proportion or scale, well, it rarely has any connection to architecture. There are some buildings where a part of a building is deliberately exaggerated, like some of Frank Gehry's modern museum buildings and things where, you know, he delivered, the architect deliberately exaggerates some part of the building for visual effect, but that's not typical of most architecture. So there is no altered proportion or scale in this structure. Okay, moving on. This is fascinating. Um, <clears throat> there's quite a bit to say about this is the uh, third must know, just two words, palace door, palace door. And the um, Country is one I was mentioning to Nigeria and -E -E Nigeria. I need to lay anybody else in. Yeah, there we go. Howdy. Hello. So we're just on the third must know. So I'll repeat that. Palace, two words, palace door, Nigeria, 1910. Let's start out with I already said this in the introduction, but I'll repeat it because it's relevant to the meaning of this. Nigeria is a very important country in not just Africa, but in the world, because first of all, it's the most populous country in Africa, and it has a heritage. So if you didn't write this before, now you probably should with the notes on the meaning of this slide. It has a history of having for hundreds of years before the arrival of Europeans, a highly developed um, urban civilization um, back several hundred years ago, that at least the word for that, uh, King, there was a kingdom, uh, was um, Songhai or Songhai, S O N G H A I, 
and I already said they had cities and uh, uh, communication and transportation system to connect the populations and they had a capital and they had a, a king who ruled from a central location. It was a well-developed urban civilization before the arrival of Europeans. By this time, when this was created, it was a British colony. It remains today one of the more prosperous countries, and yet it has a huge population of, of poor because, of course, there's no <laughs> nothing close to even distribution of natural resources or the wealth that comes from that. But they have a very developed urban economy too, Nigeria. Like I said, I've known several people from the country today called Nigeria, which is the most populous, not physically largest, that would be the Congo. Uh, or, well, Sudan has been broken up, so yeah, it would be the Congo, but it's one of the physically largest, but it is by far the most populous country, it's like 180 million people. Okay, so what are we looking at here? Well, this is during the British colonial period when they still were many um, towns, see now when you say village to me it implies very small population city that's you know in the hundreds of thousands or at least very large so this is somewhere in between so this was a regional capital or a center where a uh, a local ruler had full power but the british of course could intervene because they controlled the colony from their capital city that they had created so this was an independent semi there we go that's the word semi or quasi independent uh, rulers palace door and that ruler oh yeah sorry <clears throat> yeah i am so flustered from losing almost losing everything that i i brought it i have it hang on <laughs> you guys give me a minute we don't want to lose connection in the middle of a lecture uh, it's been one of those days okay it just needs to be plugged in as you might guess there we go all right, so that won't be an interruption the remainder of today's lecture. Okay, back to the point of what this is, is a, about a 10 foot tall door to a, um, it's similar in a way to the concept of that last slide we saw about the uh, local village ruler having, you know, a building which was both a residence for the king, the local ruler and his family, and then also a meeting place. That would be the same in that sense here in this part of Africa. This is West Africa. If you look at a map of Africa, Nigeria is, you know, a huge portion of that section of Africa. Um, and so what they would have done is traded with the British, you know, from their own towns and villages in the interior of Nigeria with semi-independent or semi, you know, uh, free uh, rule. But when the British chose to, of course, they could intervene in, in, in whatever way they wanted, obviously, because they were overall ruling this entire area that today is a country called Nigeria from a central location. So this exhibits a, uh, an event in that uh, town. I'll call it a town, meaning not just a little village, but you know, a few thousand people, that's a good size uh, community where the local ruler was greeting and, and uh, uh, you know, accepting a visit by the British you know, colonial, well, governor, right? That would be the governor of a British colony of Nigeria. And so the king is here, if it's not obvious. Look at this. These are beautifully done, detailed uh, figures here. That's the king with his headdress. And um, then there are some of the, you know, attendants, we'll say, right? I, I don't know if you want to say servants, they probably were, but you know, attendants that he would have had, you know, accompany him to any public event. And then some of his wives would have had more than one wife are on the panel below that. The whole, you can say village, what village or town would have probably been ordered, you know, at least all the adults, uh, to turn out to greet this visiting dignitary from the British colonial you know, capital, again, it would be almost certainly the governor or maybe vice governor, you know, second in charge of the whole colony. Now, what's interesting are some of the other details here. These are faces of previous rulers. Now, does that sound familiar? Remember when we covered uh, with the uh, different parts of the Maori culture in New Zealand, right, on Monday? Uh, if you were at that lecture, right, or you can see it when I post it on Friday, uh, they had that same concept that they did images of their deceased rulers in public monuments as a sign of respect and also the idea that that might be a way to get protection or have those spirits of deceased rulers guarding or watching over that 
that town, that population of that village, and maybe also guiding the current uh, uh, ruler, the current king. But down here, this is fascinating, is the partially dismembered body of a criminal, someone who had been arrested for doing some violent crime or some horrible crime, and they've been uh, punished. And that, of course, is an indication of the fact that uh, if you, you know, violated the laws of that uh, uh, town or village, you'd be punished on the order of the king. And then up here are uh, some other ones of the king's wives who would be maybe uh, bearing children, of course, small children in the, the backpack type of, uh, arrangement and they're coming to again the center of the village to greet this visiting British, you know, uh, um, governor or, or, you know, you could just say dignitary. He would have been probably near the top of the British colonial power structure. Okay, it's fascinating because these figures are all smaller than life, but here we got scale issues. So let's go ahead and do the formal elements. The king, of course, is shown as the largest, just the way the Egyptians thousand years earlier would always show the pharaoh as larger than any other figure in the same scene. So we have the uh, deliberate uh, altered a uh, scale of A, the ruler is largest, than, larger than any other figures. Then we have his, you know, you can say preferred or favorite, maybe is a better word, favorite wives on the top level. They're larger than his other wives down below who are walking towards the you know, center of the village <clears throat> for this public event, greeting this British ambassador or dignitary. <clears throat> and then the, the smallest figures are the, you know, the servants or assistants. And then there is a slight exaggeration again on the deceased uh, cr criminal, the punished, you know, now has been punished and has died uh, as a warning to others not to commit the same crime. And uh, so he's slightly larger than the other villagers, except for the emperor's wives and the emperor. Uh, because the artist, probably the emperor, I'm sure the emperor ordered this type of detail and requested that that panel show a larger figure as a warning again to anyone thinking, contemplating, doing any kind of crime, serious crime. It's fascinating how this piece is. Okay, so this is obviously got carved line everywhere and realistic simulated textures on the uh, king's headdress, uh, on their hair, their faces, uh, and their attire, right? Um, of the and then these barrels that are being carried by these servants, and even on the uh, you could say backpack or papoose. I mean that's a word of native indigenous North American culture would have used, right? Uh, of these uh, preferred wives, sorry, or favorite wives at the top. But there's also similar texture on these faces of deceased rulers uh, over on the far left in each panel. All, of course, done with carved line. There is no painted line here. It's almost all a warm color, but I've had some students say, well, this looks more neutral. It's kind of a dark gray. If it was solid black, you'd definitely call that neutral. But I see it as, as gray, and gray, therefore, is a cool color. So yes, you could say that at least on some of the hairs, hair, sorry, hairdos, I meant to say hairdos of some of the wives in the lower panel, uh, and then definitely this geometric, and that's what it's just purely a geometric decorative detail behind the uh, king and his assistants and behind his favorite wives. That does have a cool uh, kind of uh, gray color. And yet the entire panel is made of wood, which is always warm, as are almost all the figures. Okay, then what about modeling? Well, here it's a bas relief panel. Remember that word implies things with a raised figure off a flat background, right? So what you have is a bas relief panel for each one of these one, two, three, four, five, six panels, as well as all of the smaller panels showing the faces or heads, actually the heads of deceased rulers or ancestral rulers. Um, and so that is due to the sun creating the natural modeling. Now, of course, this isn't a museum. Uh, and that is part of the concept. It's part of the design. If without the modeling, the effect of the sun, the artist you know, wouldn't be able to show us the details in each figure raised as they are with shadows around them. 
uh, the rhythm is obvious, the human bodies, arms, hands, legs, feet. For space, this is interesting. What we have for space is actually a rare example in this class, at least, of register line, because these figures are uh, approaching the center, you know, the, as you say, the ceremonial event in the center of the village uh, at the same time. So the king has his preferred wives perhaps going first into the center of the village to greet this visiting British ambassador or, or uh, governor. And then he's coming up just after that and so forth. So in fact, this deceased criminal, you know, dead, punished criminal, would not be in the center of the village during a ceremony for a visiting dignitary. That would be considered, you know, improper. So he would be further away from us. So obviously, this indicates that they're using a concept that goes back to ancient Egypt. It literally does. The first culture to use register line were the Egyptians in their bas relief stone panels of the pharaoh and all the other figures around it the pharaoh. So it's fascinating. But of course, also here we have overlapping. I don't see any foreshortening. So overlapping of the body parts of the figures and the clothing or headdresses uh, that they're wearing. Um, and then we have uh, stable. Well, the doorway is stable. The panels are stable. The figures are mostly upright. But of course, there are dynamic details. The tops of their heads, some of the arms and legs are at diagonal. So it's a mixture of stable and dynamic. Everything's done with carved line. There's not really any other kind of line, no painted line. Um, uh, each panel is roughly balanced. Now this figure is you know, partially missing, but originally you know, two here, two there, two here, two here. It's roughly balanced. Now, in fact, there's only one figure, the, the king, um, entering on his donkey, I guess it would be, or horse. I'm not sure which, probably donkey. And his, but the, he's so big that he roughly, I would say, roughly balances out with the two attendants, the figures behind him. Uh, and then here, there are three of his favorite wives, but you know, one's de almost dead center and the other two. So it, they were all, each panel is roughly balanced. Um, OK, uh, let me see. Am I forgetting anything? Space, modeling, rhythm I did cover. Yeah, OK. So now let's move on to the last must know for this. Topic. How tall is it? Oh. Yeah, I was saying, uh, yeah, right before, I guess, like this one, you know, it's 10 feet. Yeah, so thank you for bringing that up, because that's part of the meaning. I'll say that again. Under space, you would want to say, this is a real object, which is 10 feet tall. Those are pretty massive doors, wouldn't they be? And there would have been two of them, so we only have the one that somehow made it into a museum. I have no idea. It's probably in London, I would guess, because they took all these things from their colonies and put them in the British Museum, mostly in London. So uh, originally, it would have been two panels but what we see is one panel roughly uh, about uh, three to four feet wide and it's 10 feet tall. I never really... You yeah. mean they stole them? Well, you, oh, we can't use that word. They expropriated them. They're still antiquities. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, right. They stole that, them. That's an issue that uh, I don't think too many people anymore who have an open brain <laughs> would argue with. <laughs> yeah, the museums, though, resist returning things. And, you know, in some cases I can see, but it's rare, that they have some legitimate reason they can prove that they didn't take it without permission. And that's rare, but most of the time they didn't get permission, of course. <laughs> All right, right, let's. this is a fascinating figure, our last must know. And this is Reliqui Guardian. Reliquary. Some people look like it looks like reliquary. It's reliquary. At least that's how I heard it pronounced. Guardian. I'll spell the word first word. R e l i q u a r y. Guardian. Of course. Thank you all. Know how to spell that? Yep. Unless somebody needs me to. Okay. And then the location, the country of Gabon, again in West Africa. Uh, I believe it was a former French colony, late 1800s. So this is another one of those figures, or you could say figurine, you know, smaller than life, much smaller than life size. But this one's a little more substantial than the spirit spouse. This one would be a good solid 18 inches to two feet tall. It has a very specific function. So that's where the title Reliqui Garden, uh, Guardian comes in. This culture believed, this uh, African culture, which is now where the country named Gabon is, uh, th this culture believed that 
you could invoke the, well, a lot of cultures believe this, but this is a physical evidence of this belief. It's a spiritual or religious belief they had in which they felt that your ancestors, the spirits of your ancestors uh, could be watching over you to protect you. And I, you know, that's not an unknown to all kinds of other religious you know, uh, beliefs systems right around the world. I think it's a fascinating idea. When I thought I was going to die going off the bridge, I just told you about on the San Rafael Bridge at 70 miles an hour when two tires blew out on me. I remember thinking uh, this is something I hope there's a spirit of my daddy just passed away not long before that. Watching over me, you can believe what you want, that's your business, but it's not, in, not, in other words, unique by any means to African religious uh, beliefs. Uh, but it is a very powerful belief in this particular culture. And, and the evidence is the kind of figures that these, again, shaman, man or woman, holy man or woman, a shaman, would carve for a family to help not only communicate with past deceased, or you could just say past sounds like they might have just moved away, deceased ancestors, but to ask those ancestors to put their positive, you can say, if energy uh, into protecting and helping, both protecting and helping the living members of the, that family, the, the descendants of those deceased ancestors would, through the power of a figure, a reliquy figure, but reliquy implies something more specific too. This would be placed over a box, usually wooden, a large wooden box with various objects that were tied to the, those deceased ancestors. You know, maybe a lock of hair or two. I doubt they would have bones. I don't think so. Uh, that, but, but things that that person, uh, you know, while they were alive, you know, a, a, a grandparent, a great grandparent, whatever, a predecessor, uh, one of your deceased ancestors might have used in their daily life or had some importance to that person while they were on earth. And then usually something else like maybe a lock of hair or a piece of personal you know, jewelry or something. And those would be in this box called a reliquy box. And then this figure would be placed on top of that. And again, just like it was with the spirit spouse, the first slide we started with, in this culture, they had a similar belief that you had to uh, maintain, or you can say, take care of is a better word, take care of these figures in order to get the benefit from the spirit coming through the figure into the real world or the, you know, world of the living, if you want to put it that way, to help them and protect them. In order to do that, you had to feed them, put food in front of them. You know, I assume that in front of the, the, the legs, you see the feet are missing here, right? They've been slightly damaged, but uh, would originally have had, you know, feet supporting it. And of course, it, I just said, would be placed atop a box here, which you could then, of course, take the figure off when you felt like you needed to look at some of the relics. The reliquy is a box containing relics from someone who's deceased, of course. And so you would then have to polish the wood. That's the other important thing. You see how the wood looks very shiny. Uh, you, you can say wax, but it isn't the same as like waxing a car or something. It's, it's much more gentle. And so I would call it polishing, or you can say a kind of waxing of the wood every, every day. I'm pretty sure you were supposed to do that constantly. And then you would pray to this figure for the ancestor spirit to come through that reliquy figure and help you with some problem your family faced and uh, or protect you from some danger. It's a fascinating concept. And this figure is, uh, again, the kind of details on this body that we're going to do in the formal analysis, what makes it uh, not just a straightforward uh, effigy of a living person. Obviously, we know it's a, a deceased ancestor is the inspiration, the slight exaggerations of some parts of the physique here. Uh, were an inspiration for almost all of the first uh, abstract artists in Europe and later North America, like Picasso and Matisse. And they, to their credit, openly stated that from the beginning, that they wouldn't have thought of some of their techniques of uh, abstract style painting and sculpture that they had developed in, in, in the early 20th century if they hadn't seen African arts, particularly African sculpture or the other culture they sometimes mentioned was Pacific Island. Uh, figures which we saw yesterday or no Monday in the lecture. Okay, so that's an important part of the meaning of all these of these images we've seen today. <clears throat> all right, let's do a formal analysis and then I will take a few minutes to show you just a handful, like 10 minutes of slides from the Art Institute to Chicago and those will be for your own enjoyment and they also might give you some inspiration for 
perhaps a future trip or extra credit project. All right, this is, as I said, it's a real figure. So it's got real space, but it's not anywhere near normal human size. It's about 18 inches uh, in height. And uh, of course, all the lines are carved and that creates simulated texture on the eyes, the mouth, the nose, the muscles and the fascinating, and even the, see how it looks like an abstract sculpture from the 1930s or something. It's way ahead of its time if you say, but of course, this is the original source for those abstract artists, this kind of sculpture. Um, and you see the fingers, the way they're, you know, like you would when you put your fingers together and press, it's fascinating, the, the, the poses and the, uh, the, the kind of implied intense energy that this figure is conjuring up to help his living descendants when they pray to him and he can or her uh, they can uh, intervene uh, so you see the the textures here are uh, both simulated on the face mostly and on the hands a little less so on the rest of the body and real smooth wood texture the smooth polished wood it's entirely warm it's a color of dark wood which is always a kind of dark brown uh, the lines are all carved of course wherever we see any of the body parts uh, it is a single mass, unless you want to say the headdress is a separate mass, you could, then that would be the second largest. <clears throat> um, but it is balanced, completely symmetrical, and I would say both ways. The width of the arms and, and the, the hips, the shoulders, it's about the same. And the head and the torso, it's roughly balanced, both top to bottom and left to right. There's no modeling, remember, it's always lighting from whatever it is. There would have been, of course, sunlight on it in a house when it was created in the late 1800s in an African village, it would have had natural sunlight modeling, but now it's museum lighting. Um, it is stable because it's upright and looking straight at us, but of course the details around the top of the head, of course, and the shoulders and the, the hips are dynamic. Here we have, uh, well, yeah, there's overlapping. I should have mentioned that. For space, it's real, but there is the overlapping of the arms over the, you know, the, the waist and the headdress over the forehead. Um, but it's important to mention in all, all African sculpture that we're seeing, at least in this uh, semester, uh, there is a deliberate distortion of proportion. You could even use that phrase in your notes or write it however you want. But the point is these are not, is deliberately meant to be uh, slightly, you can say altered or exaggerated proportions the head is larger than it would normally be for the size of the rest of the body, while the legs are shorter than they would be in a normal human adult figure. And that's deliberate. It's meant to emphasize the parts of the physique or body of this deceased ancestor that are the most important. Of course, you're gonna talk or pray to it or ask it things. So the face and head are the most important part. Uh, and then the arms are as or more important than the legs because that's where you see, like I said, with the hands, pressed together in the middle. That's not a minor detail. It's an important part of the uh, design where the energy flowing through the figure could come to the human family that's praying to it that, you know, this is one of their ancestors. So that energy is important and therefore the arms are more emphasized than the legs proportionately. Okay, so now um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, while we talk, I'll take any questions here. Let me just pull up the, uh, the slides that I have from, oh yeah, that's right. We have this issue where it likes to play hide and seek. Okay, there we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't do this. <laughs> There's something about the way this likes to do that. Okay, um, what I wanted to tell you is if you remember on Monday, I did say that we would go to um, see slides from, let's see, I'm just looking at where we are. Oops, set as default. I didn't touch anything with that. Things today, you notice as we have. Let's look at the, um, from the actual, oh yeah, this is, sorry, under documents. The, whoop, the other documents. Okay, I wanted to show you just a few slides. We'll see if I can't get to them in the ne next 90 seconds. We'll just do it another day uh, for my visit to the Art Institute of Chicago. And then still stick around as always and take questions. If you join late, one or two of you did, I think it's a courtesy. I'll explain to you what happened, which was that uh, I lost uh, my the use of my car. I had a, a blowout on my way to 
the shopping better today and I had to wait until I had a tow. And by the time I borrowed my other family car, I barely made it. Here. But I'm lucky mm -hmm. it happened on the kid. All right, I'll give it one more try here. She makes her own bunch. Yeah, there it is. This is it. Okay, here we go. Here we go. For what it's worth, I'll just show you a few of these. I'm going to show you the ones in my yard of food in Chicago. If you didn't know this, the most famous Impressionist paintings outside of Europe are owned by that museum and then also the Met. Uh, we're getting some uh, back are they? Someone please mute yourself, please. This is the famous, uh, you've all seen this. It was in that silly movie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, set in Chicago, of course. Uh, it's one of the most famous paintings of the 1800s. And it is a scene from Paris in the late 19th century. We're going to see it when we don't have to take any notes now. Paris Street, Rainy Day. I love this painting. It's life size. It's huge. It has a whole wall to itself. I'm just giving you an idea. This museum is well worth a visit. No matter what type of art you're interested in, it has a really wide collection of Western and world art. We'll go to the world art part, though, mostly. Yeah, when I was a kid, I could actually hear this couple talking to each other and where they're going to go for dinner. <laughs> I can imagine that. It's fascinating, you know. But now we get to the section of world art. This is a, a Chinese painted um, cabinet from the mid 18th century, like 250 years ago. And of course, if you might not know, there was already trade with China. Uh, at that point, China was still a very powerful independent country before it started getting incurred, <laughs> uh, encroached on by European powers, of course, and then had a period of, of decline and then overthrew that, those colonial influences. But what I found fascinating, besides the armor collection, which we'll go through quickly because I want to get to the world art. Um, look at these, even the horses had armor. These are from the Renaissance era. You know, we're talking about 15, early 1600s when it was. Excuse me. Yes. I can't see anything. Oh, uh oh. Oh, I've been showing all these slides and thank you for saying that. What the I'm heck? like, I don't, but where are they? Yeah. Exactly. Okay, something happened, and that's probably because. It's my bad. Let's go to, there we go. Can you see that now? Thank you. You know, I know that's, that was my oversight. Hopefully you can see this now. Yes. Oh, good. So I'll go back. This is that famous painting, Paris Street, Rainy Day, where the, this couple is, you know, I felt like they were talking to anyone standing in front. It's life size, these figures, the, the two closest figures to the, front of the painting or the edge of the painting. Yeah, but that's not what I wanted to focus on. It's the world art. So I was saying that this is a Chinese hand painted mid 18th century, you know, 1750s or so, a uh, piece of uh, exported, of course, for the European, they call it the China trade, uh, before the colonial incursions or, um, uh, you know, it, uh, in pieces of China were taken by various European countries, of course, before they overthrew those. Uh, foreign powers. Okay, let's go past this. Even though I love this section, I wanted to show you some of the world art stuff, but we may have time to look at this. These are the biggest collection of armor in the United States, if not in the whole Western Hemisphere, owned by a museum that was bulldozed, demolished, and it's still an empty lot. It was an authentic medieval castle brought from England, brought to Chicago when I was, before I was born, in fact. And when I was a kid, every school kid liked going there because it was full of hundreds of figures dressed in the original armor from the period that these were. And these were bought from England legally by a, an American millionaire who wanted to share his collection and create a museum, fascinating. Uh, some people think that uh, one of these masks, you know, look at these two guys having a joust, you know, but on foot. And then this, these are the, you know, more common th uh, concept, you know, of jousting is two guys on a horse with a lance. Right? And then the individual helmets. Now that's the kind of armor that the Spanish conquistadors would have worn. Uh, and then this would be French or English. But some people think this one looks like Hannibal Lecter from Science <laughs> One of my students said that it doesn't look very uh, inviting. It looks kind of evil, doesn't it? But let's get on all the way. Here we go. Now we're going to get to the world art section. This is actually still European uh, miniatures. But now look at these. I love these. We already have seen seated. 
and standing Buddhas. Remember, we covered that earlier. So here we have seated Buddhas from different parts of Asia. And I have in my notes, but it, you don't have to take it this down. I said, this is not for being tested. It's just for your in, in, enrichment or enjoyment. But this life-size figure is done with different kinds of very hard stone. They wouldn't be intact. Look down to the toes and the fingers and the head, you know, the hair, the hairdo. Uh, this is one image of Buddha. I believe this was from what now is Cambodia. And then here's another one. Fascinating. Like they're in the middle of meditating, contemplating, uh, thinking about the meaning of life, which, of course, Buddha was obviously very famous for. And here's a more traditional image from Japan of a seated Buddha. And here's another one uh, from, it almost looks like it's from Central America, from Mayan or Incan culture, but uh, it's actually uh, Asian. And I believe this one was uh, from uh, China. And then we have a hide painting. I, I, we already covered one, remember, it's on the syllabus, so you did get notes, I hope, from that. Or if you didn't see the lecture Monday, you'll see the video posted on YouTube on Friday. I love this because the colors, look at the colors here. This is huge. This is the actual height of a buffalo, minus the legs, the one we saw in the slides for the syllabus. The legs themselves were tanned as part of the uh, painting, of course. It's, but here they just decided to just use the central section of the height. But look at these colors. They're wonderfully rich. And this is to celebrate a victory by one of the Plains Indians um, tribes over one of their enemies. It's another view of it. And then this is, it should be obvious, pre-Columbian, uh, i.e. indigenous Central American. Uh, and this would be early Mayan, probably, before the Spanish era, long before that, about 1100 or 1200, when they had these huge cities all over what's now Mexico or Southern Mexico and Central America. and. Uh, they had different kinds of gods and goddesses, including some that had, look at this one, cat-like figures. Of course, the Egyptians worshipped uh, cats themselves, and also they had a couple of goddesses. I think the one that had a cat's head was Bat, B-A-T. Yeah, that was, if you haven't seen the exhibit, um, extra credit, <laughs> uh, again, uh, you know, hint, is to go to the um, De Young Museum in Spongay Park before the end of the semester and see that fantastic exhibit of the feral skull. Now, this is African sculpture. These are life-size figures, and look at the colors and the expression on these were meant to scare away evil spirits from a, a particular village. And here's a life-size figure of a, um, a Mayan priest, a high priest, conducting some kind of religious ceremony. It's fascinating. This is all new. Well, when I was there, it was just been opened. It was 2018. So I think it was like the year before. What is it? Five years now. The whole new wing that was added to this museum that didn't exist when I was growing up. The World Art Wing. It's, it's really it's worth a whole day just to see that. Not to mention the other section of the older collections they've had opened since 1893, the year the museum opened, where the Impressionists are and post-Impressionists and other types of paintings. So it's worth a couple of days. The Art Institute of Chicago is the name of that museum. And then here's something you can see at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, similar to what you can see there. A uh, half life size camel on the uh, Silk Road, traveling the Silk Road, the famous Silk Road that went from China all the way to Persia across the mountains where they traded the Persian Muslim cultures, of course, with the uh, Buddhist Chinese uh, cultures. Uh, at the same time, we're talking about during what was the, this was during the dark ages in Europe, like eight, 900 AD when Europe was mired in ignorance. Um, okay, and then the last image I'll show you is of uh, Shiva, which is one of the, is the most powerful, many would say, of all the Hindu gods. And you can't say she, even though many people assume it's female because it's multi, <laughs> right? Uh, gender, um, both male and female and, and more than that and has ultimate power over the universe over life and death and destruction and creation. So this is about a half life size figure that's uh, made out of metal in one of the galleries. And then there's your view of the uh, part of downtown Chicago. Okay, so I just wanted to share some of that with you and let's do the stop share and I'll take any questions you may have. All right, because we've actually- read Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I have a piece that was given to me um, from Japan by a gentleman I used to date, and um, he told me that it was very valuable. 
Yeah. Now, should I take it to yeah. Michon's? I was going to suggest, I know him, and he's, I've had a few of my former students ask me similar questions, and at least they're going to get an honest assessment. But of course, if you go mm -hmm. through that to sell it in auction, you know how it works. I'm sure you, you've got mm -hmm. it. I, mean, I, I never have. I bought things in a small, you know, nothing expensive I can't afford, but you know, uh, you know three figure. <laughs> Mm -hmm. items for my house but it sounds like this would be worth more he, oh yeah his, yeah his staff i know people that work there and some of them are former students of mine mm -hmm. uh so i would uh, yes uh, it's in oakland and he lives in alameda i have the address yeah you got it i would do that i recommend okay it. because he told me he said this is um very valuable yes and you should then definitely get it so a, a i was just wondering if you would recommend them I absolutely okay would. Yeah. okay yeah um, okay, any other questions about extra credit? Uh, the, the slides, I know we got started late and I already explained this. I had a blowout right? not long before I was supposed to start driving up here. So by the time AAA showed up and towed my car to a, a tire shop where I'll get the new tires by Thursday and you're lucky, borrowed you're another car, I was lucky I got here at all. I barely got to the building by three. So if you noticed I hadn't sent the invitation that's why it wasn't anything i could have control luckily it didn't happen to blow out on the freeway or i wouldn't have been here at all thank you for your patience all of you okay i do have another you're lucky question. yeah i know i am that's what my daughter were you, said she were you said, over the bridge blessings. no that was back in 2010 or 12 maybe when my car was totaled then the highway patrolman who came to help i gotta give those guys high mark he he blocked the cars from behind me so we, i didn't get rear-ended stayed there until the tow truck came it took like 30 40 minutes and told me you did just the right thing by steering the car the right way when mm -hmm. you have a blowout a double blowout mm -hmm. you might not have made it out alive if you had it because it was you know rush hour traffic at 70 miles mm. Yeah, so I, I definitely am not going to take a chance. It was a piece of uh, metal that just happened to be probably somewhere on my street, you know, when I parked the night before. I didn't see it until I got to the Safeway parking lot, but then it was too late. The tire was shredded. But that's why I wasn't able to log you guys on at 245. Okay, but thank you guys for your patience. All right, I think yeah, we're ready to call it. And then next week, we're going to start. You'll see if you take ahead, uh, look ahead. Um, we're going to go to uh, some painting, uh, romanticism. It's a fascinating topic uh, where you start to see artists address issues we still have today, like slavery and the evils of racism in, in general, and, and also specifically uh, public accountability for uh, you know mass deaths when it could have been prevented, war crimes, all of those things that are part of modern life, sadly, and you see them happening all over the world, most recently and most notably in mm -hmm. the city I have friends in Kiev, and they're being bombed by these crazy Iranian Miss, uh, not missiles, but the, you know, deadly um, drones is what they're called. Absolutely nothing about war, you know, uh, functioning. It's all civilian targets. Every day, dozens of them dying in the streets, not knowing if they're going to make it through the day because these things just come with no guidance and they just crash into any building that they finally happen to hit. Yeah, so we still have these uh, issues, as you know, some of, uh, of uh, the world today. And already 200 years ago, some of the romantic painters were addressing these very issues that you'll see the relevance of. I think you'll find them fascinating. So that's our topic for next week. All right, I'll see you guys, okay, on uh, Monday. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions, you can email me in the meantime. And also, I will, of course, post the lectures from today and Monday's lecture by uh, probably well before 8 p.m. on Friday. All right. One more time. Any urgent questions? All right. See you guys uh, on Monday. Have a good week. Take care. Bye.